The Madison Incline is the steepest non-cog grade in North America. It has been in existence since the early 1840s. When they broke ground here originally in 1836, the reason they chose Madison was as you looked at a map in the state house when they were passing the legislation to build a new railroad, they looked at that map and determined that Madison to Indianapolis was the shortest distance. In the process of that, they never realized the fact until it was too late that it was a 416 foot drop from the top of the hill to the bottom of the hill in less than a mile and a quarter to get to the Ohio River. Not being deterred, they decided to blow open the mountain and make their way down the incline. At the time the incline was built, they had done their engineering and determined that it would be no issue climbing this hill. However, after the first train went down the hill and back up the hill, they determined from then on that they would start bringing the cars up one at a time with horses and mules. To take the cars down, they would let them drift down on gravity and operate the handbrake. As you can imagine, with wet leaves and winter days, there was several accidents and several dead hogs at the bottom of the hill multiple times. Madison as a riverfront was considered to be the future of Indiana. It exceeded river traffic more than Cincinnati and Louisville combined at the time. But eventually the incline was the Achilles heel in the railroad. With it being so steep, as soon as other railroads popped up, such as the line from Jeffersonville to Indianapolis, lines from Cincinnati, from the Ohio River, all the way up to Indianapolis, the line suddenly found itself into several receiverships, bankruptcies, and mergers. The fact that the line is in existence is the sheer determination of people in this area that kept this line going multiple times including in the 1960s when we had a major washout on the incline, the line was dormant down that incline. And eventually it came back and the railroad had to adapt through the years to how it came back. One of the first adaptations was is they designed a cog system uh, that was a what would they called a rack and pinion system that actually had a track laid down the center of the railroad track. Very similar to a roller coaster when you hear the click, click, click to keep the train from sliding down the hill. The problem with that was is through the warm summers and the cold winters, that particular rack in the center of the track would warp. It would come unspiked. It would jam up in the engine and they had continuous failures. Finally, later on, the chief mechanical officer of the Jeffersonville and Madison and Indianapolis at that time was a gentleman by the name of Reuben Wells. He finally designed a 10-wheel steam locomotive that had a boiler that had a 15-degree offset in order to keep the water in the jacket at the level it should be. It was used on the downhill side of any cuts to shove cars up, and then it would take them right back down. Where we were at earlier at Mies Orbitron was a roundhouse that was there, the actual turntable was there until that building was built in the 50s. And that was the servicing facility for the steam locomotives that ran up and down the incline. The Reuben Wells did have a sister engine that wasn't built specially for it, but it was more of a backup. But the Reuben Wells stayed in existence to the early 1900s. It later was, went on to uh, tour at the World's Fair in Chicago. Uh, Pennsylvania brought it back and rebuilt it, and they later donated it to uh, the Children's Museum prior to it being at Purdue University as a locomotive they used to study boiler design. Through the years as that locomotive was uh, retired, they went with their 080 locomotives. They would bring trains out of Columbus, Indiana. When they got to the proving ground, there was a Y on the old Pennsylvania Railroad. They would Y the steam locomotive, put it back on the train, and they would come into town tender first. So through all the years, from pretty much the early 1900s till steam engines disappeared, no steam engine came into town on a southbound move in the forward position. It was always tender first. We can't find any pictures of a steam locomotive facing south coming into town. Then in the 1950s, EMD got together with Pennsylvania Railroad 
and designed two specialty, what they called Cadillac locomotives. They were SD7s that were weighted down with extra weight. In addition, they designed a new wheel slip system that actually dropped the load off completely so the engine would stop its electricity going to the wheels, would apply a sand automatically, and then that, once that sand was applied, the load would go back on those motors so that they didn't lose momentum. That later production move of automatic sanders was put into every MD locomotive after that. In addition, they also had Gardner Denver design a six-cylinder compressor. That also later became a production model compressor that was put in more locomotives, but the first two were in those SD7s. We later found those same compressors in many locomotives, including on the Southern Railroad. The SD7s did a wonderful job up until the Penn Central filed for bankruptcy and decided to leave the line. Once the Madison Railroad took this over, they actually contracted out to another company called Madison Railway that ran it for just a, less than two years. They had a lot of operational issues and the city ended up taking it back from Madison Railway. But Madison Railway had an SW1 and that SW1 is what was used on the incline. Now being only 600 horsepower versus a 1500 horsepower six axle, they had to hit the bottom of the hill with anything they were taking up at a very rapid rate, sometimes 20, 30 mile an hour. By the time they got to the top of the hill, they were down to where you wouldn't even be able to see a speed indicator move. And some of the most famous stories are obviously the runaways. Well, with the Madison Railway, why they, when Madison Railroad, the city took it over, with that SW1, they had a scrapyard at the bottom of the hill. And one day, the engineer, who is still is part of Madison Railroad, he sits on our board of directors, he's a former chairman of the board, his name is uh, Larry. Larry literally had an incident where he grabbed a scrap car, they took it up the hill, what they didn't realize is that the car was full of water. And as they got to the top of the hill, almost to the very top, Larry noticed suddenly his wheel slip light came on. And before he could look back up, he was sliding backwards. And what had happened is all the water in that gondola had ran down to those drain holes and covered the rail from one end to the other. So Larry took a nice ride all the way down to the bottom of the incline. So it's quite, it's quite a wonderful story when you hear it, but at the time, it wasn't so much fun. Uh, we have been very fortunate not to have any major incidents, but I do know there was a few more as time went on. Well, the incline is actually still retained by the City of Madison Port Authority. It is still in, uh, it's complete, meaning all the rail, the ties and everything are there. Uh, we had a major uh, refurbishment on it for historical purposes uh, about four years ago, I think it was 2013. When that was complete, it was open to the public for hiking and what have you. However, there are dangers of falling rock in the middle cut. The middle cut is very undercut. Uh, at the time that the railroad was built, some of the techniques that the railroad used were not uh, what we would do today. Normally you would cut back a hill at, a, at an angle. Uh, this was somewhat straight up. So over time, water has eroded away and there are times when you look up there, you may see 20, 30 foot of rock hanging over your head. So we still have quite a few uh, rocks that fall in that location. We currently have a section that has slid off and down into the valley previously. When we went to rebuild the incline, that particular section was, the rail was all slid over on good ground. Uh, within a year of the project being done, we found a fairly large crack developing and now it is not even safe to take a high rail vehicle on, which we used to be able to do, uh, because it's humped up so bad. So the, it's starting to slide back down again. As far as hikers, we just warn anybody that wants to hike the incline to use extra caution. Uh, it should only be done by the healthy uh, and make sure somebody knows that you're doing it uh, because it is dangerous to some extent. Uh, this is not the most stable ground in the world. However, for the sake of historic purposes, uh, several people have wanted to see it open to the public. Uh, we don't discourage it being open to the public. However, we still warn people it's quite dangerous. It is there 
for the purpose of if we ever need to go back down it for some reason. We don't foresee that. It would take millions of dollars to put it back in service. But I will say to add to the construction of the line, this line is one of the best, was one of the best built in 1836 to 1838 from here to North Vernon. It has stone arch bridges that are still in existence today with very little work been done on them. Uh, the T-rail that was used was different from what you saw on East Coast railroads, including the first railroad built in Ohio, which was strap rail. What happened though is they spent their entire budget between here and North Vernon and went bankrupt. Now when I say bankrupt, there was a financial crisis in the state of Indiana. The state of Indiana didn't necessarily go bankrupt, however they ran out of money for the project. So from then on, from North Vernon on, it was built a little bit less to higher standards. <laughs>